Thank you all for being here for this discussion. Very excited to be able to have Murray, uh, Murray Hubert to discuss uh, this great book. Um, but before we um, launch into that, I would love to be able to provide an introduction. Um, so Murray currently um, serves as the head of research for Bauer Group Asia, a government affairs consulting firm focused on the Indo-Pacific region. Um, Murray is a top Asia expert and skilled researcher with three decades of experience living and working in Asia. His networks in business, media, and government circles are deep and wide ranging. And um, as soon as you read the book, Under Beijing Shadow, you definitely uh, can tell. There's no better person to be writing a book on China's uh, influence in Southeast Asia than Murray. So um, I will uh, turn it over um, to Murray. Um, I, you have some prepared remarks, and then we'll get started with the, the Q&A. Great. Thanks, Mark, and thanks, Will, for setting this up. Um, uh, talking to Will and Mark, they suggested that I should maybe just give a uh, brief overview of the key points that I cover in the book. The book really does, um, uh, after the introduction, it goes through the region country by country, and I know that's a bit of a tedious way to do it, but the countries in Southeast Asia range from tiny Laos to giant Indonesia and communist Vietnam to democratic Indonesia and, and, and rich, rich uh, Singapore or poor Laos. And you know, it goes on and on. So it's really impossible to talk. China treats them all very differently. Their history is different. Um, and so, the, but, but the general, one general point you can make is that almost every country virtually is somewhat uh, is, is, is hopeful that the relationship is gonna to lead to tremendous wealth and prosperity and anxious about whether their sovereignty is gonna, gonna survive China's rise. Um, I, tr I go through in the chapters of looking at soft power, like economic cooperation, cultural, uh, cooperation, education, and then harder power stuff like South China Sea, uh, military sales, military cooperation, and that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> economic cooperation is really the thing that countries are most excited about. Since China opened, uh, China has really literally yanked them all up by their bootstraps to, to middle income status, pretty much. And the uh, China's trade with Southeast Asia cumulative two-way trade was 600 billion in 2018. Um, that's just multi multiples higher than it had been earlier, uh, you know, at like in the early 1980s. Uh, but so China now, the US, US trade figures for 2018 were 300 billion. So China's about double what the US is right now in terms of trade. Chinese tourists are a really big deal and have had a huge impact. In fact, you go to the airports, you wish Chinese tourists weren't quite so prevalent. Uh, but if you go in Bangkok or even Myanmar or way up country someplace, it's all Chinese everywhere. It's, it's a little overwhelming. Um, and for the locals too, polling, they don't come out so well for respecting culture and stuff like that. And part of the, the uh, economic cooperation is the Belt and Road. Uh, but it's, it's really interesting. You think this is some big juggernaut, but it's struggling really pretty hard to, uh, to get to take off. Uh, there are lots of MOUs, lots of agreements, but not that much uh, uh, consummation of projects, I guess. Um, in Laos, they spent five years negotiating the high-speed rail. Uh, they knocked, Laos had a bargain for the interest rate. They knocked it down from about four, a little over 4% to about 2.3%. They forced China to back down on how much land they were going to get on both sides of the railroad. Chinese like to keep that land so that they can give it to their, to their merchants and hoteliers and those kind of people. Um, in the high-speed rail in Indonesia, which is a quite a short one uh, between uh, uh, Jakarta and Bandung, they had tremendous problems getting land. Uh, in, in the more democratic the country, the less interested the farmer is in parting with his land or her, her land. Um, and so it really was, the project was, was delayed. It was supposed to be done by Joko, the President Jokowi's uh, re-election campaign in 2019. It wasn't nearly done, still not nearly done. So uh, maybe by his, his successor's uh, election bid. 
it's impossible to get the exact number of, of how many, how much is China has spent on the Belt and Road. The RWR associates who do uh, uh, monitoring of, of uh, BRI, they estimate that it's about, it was 200 million, um, be, uh, billion rather, between 2013 and 2018. And having visited all these countries in recent years, that seems very high. I think it's lower than that. Another problem that these Belt and Road projects face is, is corruption and hefty kickbacks. Uh, the, the, the nifty um, example of that was what happened in Malaysia on the East Coast rail link. Najib, the former prime minister who set up this fund, uh, One Malaysia Development Berhad, One, one MDB, which, which uh, DOJ, US DOJ says lost about $4.5 billion. Uh, he was looking for money quickly to pay off the, uh, the uh, debts that were coming due and to have money for his reelection campaign in 2018. So the Chinese companies hugely overpaid him uh, and, and the government was clearly complicit in that, letting the loans, letting um, China Development Bank and Exim Bank, um, you know, sign up for these big loans. Uh, <clears throat> Despite these challenges, one thing that's also interesting, which I alluded to in the last example, is if, if people get really irritated and mad and there's huge protests, China will back down. And uh, so it, it did that, for example, in, in Laos, is a very, one of the best examples. In Myanmar, they were forced to back down from the Meatstone Dam in 2011, October 2011. And the ambassadors and other visiting uh, Muckety mucks from China regularly still raise that. You read it in the newspapers every month. It's, it's insane. They can't do that project. And, and yet Myanmar is being pressured to do it. Um, there's also for, uh, in Indonesia, President Jokowi, the Indonesians have their, and I'll get more into this maybe a little later, but they have their own difficulties with China. Uh, Ch China, uh, after the communist victory, they armed and supported communist movements in all the countries in Southeast Asia. Some like Vietnam didn't mind <laughs> because they were communist, they were looking for a communist revolution themselves. But, but in Indonesia, it was, it was particularly bad. And then in 65, uh, China is charged with uh, allegations of having instigated the 1965 coup. I think that's pushing China's role a little bit too far. But uh, it, it, that is the, the public narrative. The one area also where China is really successful is on the digital Silk Road. So it's very active in the digital economy, e-commerce, investing in uh, unicorns, payment schemes like Alipay, and Huawei is very active in 5G, in uh, artificial intelligence, facial recognition, all those kinds of things. And Alibaba, Tencent, JD.com are investing heavily in particularly Singapore and Indonesia. They've invested billions in companies like Gojek, uh, the, the um, motorcycle transport company that well, they do much more now. Tokopedia, uh, Traveloka, some of those. Uh, China is really playing a giant role. And they are uh, playing big roles also in uh, the 5G development except for Vietnam, which says it's going on its own, and Singapore, which went to Nokia and, and uh, Ericsson. Uh, everybody else is relying on, on, um, on Huawei. Um, the role of the ethnic Chinese, there's about 20 million ethnic Chinese that have arrived over the centuries. Uh, and and you know, they played various roles in different countries. In Malaysia, the British colonial government used them to to uh, tap rubber and to grow palm oil and, and, and uh, do tin mining. Um, and today those people all have an outsized role in the economy. Uh, you know, they'll play, uh, have a giant stake in the economy, even though there might only be a few percent of the population. That, that group of Chinese, the old Chinese, are not really much of a problem. It's the new Chinese that are a problem. So, um, since about since the uh, late '80s and '90s, there's been an influx of, and it's really picked up in recent years. Um, there's been an influx, a spontaneous influx, I think, of 
migrants moving into places like northern Myanmar, northern Laos, uh, where they are really increasingly dominant. Uh, they'll do agriculture, plant uh, rubber trees, uh, bananas, uh, uh, pumpkins, and, and watermelons, and you see the trucks just leaving from, from the La uh, Lao or Myanmar towns along the border going to China, hauling all this stuff. And then in the, uh, the in, um, uh, so I, I'm actually quite worried what's going to happen. In the future, it's quite possible that, uh, that there'll be a public uprising. Uh, just, they're very frustrated because they're being pushed out of, of towns and taking over all the noodle shops and those kinds of things, leaving nothing for the locals to do. Um, and then in, um, in uh, Manila, Philippines, in uh, Sihanoukville, Cambodia, and then in Cayenne State, which is just over the border from Thailand, uh, there's a place called Shui Koko. It's just, been, just opening up in, uh, this year. Uh, there's a lot of gambling. Uh, 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 Sihanoukville really uh, is just a big casino uh, and, and everything that goes with it, uh, brothels and drugs and all that stuff. Um, uh, the, the, a lot of it is uh, online gaming, which is illegal in China, Cambodia, uh, and Philippines, but these people all move into the gray space and get away with a lot, although Hung Sen in Cambodia has really clamped down. The history of China and these countries goes way back, obviously, with, with Vietnam, it goes back several, several millennia, uh, once in the, just the beginning of, of the, uh, I don't know what we call it, just uh, in the late, late uh, before BC period, they, um, they, they occupied uh, Vietnam and held it for 970 years or something. Um, and they, their contacts with the Filipinos date back to about the 1400s, the, with Indonesia, at least 800 years. Um, uh, the, the, um, and I talked already about how China, after the communist revolution, supported the, uh, the communist movements in, in, in all of these countries. If there are, there, it's hard to get opinion polling, but, but they're the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies in, in Singapore. Uh, every, every January release a poll of elite opinion, meaning officials, uh, businessmen, uh, academics, civil society leaders, journalists, etc. Uh, they do a survey. And the one that was released this January, 79% uh, of the elites said China now is the, has the most economic influence in the region. Only 8% said that about the US, which is a bit of a stunning figure. And 52% said that China had the most political and strategic influence. Uh, and the US had only half that at 27%. That really surprised me a little bit. But if they're forced to choose, Pretty close. Forty-six percent said they'll choose China. Fifty-four percent will choose choose the U.S. Um, talking um, a little, I'll talk just a little bit about a few other points. The the military to military ties is increasing. Some countries are are um, are buying some military equipment. The ties have ordered some tanks. They've ordered three sub submarines from China, although they postponed uh, two of them uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, due to protests about what the government was spending its money during the uh, COVID downturn. Uh, China is really ramping up uh, its, uh, its soft power, lots of scholarships, lots of students. It's hard to get really up-to-date figures, but the best ones I got for the region were 68,000 in 2016. That included 23,000 from Thailand, 15,000 from Indonesia, et cetera. Um, and then Confucian Institutes teaching uh, Mandarin are also uh, becoming more, more uh, pr prominent. Uh, there's over 30 now in Southeast Asia, almost half of them, 15 are in Thailand, and then it goes down from there, five in Malaysia, one in Vietnam, as you would expect. Uh, uh, but lots of invitations also for party officials, academics, journalists, religious leaders especially they've been going after Muslim leaders in, in, in Malaysia and Indonesia, two Muslim majority countries. They take them, of course, to Xinjiang. And many of the imams, when they come back, 
uh, to talk about, you know, that it's, it is really a nice resort and uh, camp environment. They have flowers in their rooms. Uh, they can pray five times a day. They get halal food and the whole business. And if, if you give a strong enough endorsement of what China's doing, then the Chinese ambassador, like in the case of Indonesia, will come and visit you and offer the village where the mosque is located a new something or other, like an irrigation system. So there are rewards for, uh, for saying the right thing. You, you, I, I really spent a lot of time uh, looking for political influence in places uh, in, in Southeast Asia, but it's, it's not nearly as obvious as it is in Australia or New Zealand. Uh, in in uh, Malaysia during the 2018 elections, the, the Malaysian ambassador got very active in campaign, participating in campaigning with, with the ruling party that I ended up getting defeated. Uh, and when Singapore and, uh, Malay uh, and China had a spat from mid-2016 to about, the, to about the end of 2017, uh, China went and lobbied Singapore businessmen really heavily. Singapore is by far the biggest investor in China these days. And the businessmen were told that if you don't, they told me they were told that if you don't um, uh, get your government to change its views, uh, it's going to become more difficult for you to operate. That really irritated the government to no end. China is also very uh, involved in phishing and hacking. Um, they do it even to their communist cronies in, in Vietnam, which sort of shocked me a little bit. They, they really don't have any, any friends that they won't do something weird to. But um, so they, um, uh, in 2017, Vietnam was hosting APEC and, and both President Xi and President Trump were going to visit. And the Chinese were constantly fishing and hacking to figure out what, what Vietnam was going to promote, the policies was going to promote in APEC. Also, its policies on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which both, both countries are part of, and then their negotiating stance on the South China Sea. Um, Indonesian officials complained a lot before their elections last year uh, that, that they were, that, that Chinese and Russian hackers had attacked their voters lists to, to disrupt the elections. But I'll finish with talking just briefly about the two water challenges. The one, uh, the South China Sea is, is much better known, but the Mekong has really been, been uh, coming into view much more sharply in, in the last year or so, maybe even the last six months. Um, China now has 11 dams on the higher reaches of the, of the Mekong. Um, and then it has helped build, build two in, in, on the mainstream of the, of the Mekong in Laos, but also a lot of dams on the tributaries of the Mekong in Laos. Um, and the last two years, um, the Mekong has had really a, a, a real shortage of water. Some of it was maybe the rain was a little lower than normal. Some of it might have been El Nino kind of stuff, but the the water level has been incredibly low so that the 60 million people in Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam that make their living along the Mekong are really struggling with their crops, struggling to catch fish, that kind of stuff. And then in Cambodia, if the water, Cambodia in the middle of it, I should have put up a map, sorry, but in the middle of Cambodia, slightly to the left if you're looking at the map straight on, um, it's, uh, it's Tonle Sap Lake and the river, Tonle Sap River, which links to the Mekong. And if the, when the water is in full, uh, is, is f water is fully flowing, with, after a lot of rain, uh, the Mekong flows, uh, the, the, the water flows into the Tonle Sap in one direction, and then when the rains subside, it flows back in the other direction. Now that's hugely significant because fish are really tied, there, a lot of the spawning the movements of fish are related for spawning are related to what the Tonle Sap is doing. And if the Tonle Sap doesn't reverse, it really is, is damaging to the fish. And then the, in, the, uh, in Vietnam, of, of course, um, the, the, the Mekong Delta is the breadbasket of Vietnam, uh, produces about 60% of Vietnam's food, a huge chunk of its exports. It is below sea level. And if they don't get the silt from Tibet and the water from China, 
then um, the the sub China Sea starts. Excuse me. The the uh, the de delta Mekong Delta starts falling under the sea and getting salt water, and which really destroys the crops. And I think you know roughly what China has been doing in the South China Sea for building the artificial islands, militarizing those islands. Uh, it's now got four military bases on seven of the islands that they've rebuilt, and is you know those 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 bases, the military planes can now reach any one of the Southeast Asian capitals without having to refuel. It's a, it's a bit of a, a challenge to Southeast Asians, which they hadn't faced until, until China completed the, uh, the, the building of the runways and har uh, harbors in, on these islands in 2017, I guess. The other thing China's doing is harassing fishermen, and you see them this year they've been going after uh, Natuna, nor, nor, and, which is part is northern part of Indonesia, which isn't even a disputing country. Uh, and but in all the countries off the coast of Vietnam, off the coast of Malaysia, Chinese coast guards are vessels and maritime militia vessels are there all the time. Uh, Shell cannot operate off the coast of Lukunia Shoal uh, in Malaysia without having Chinese just staring at them all the time. So it's it's a little uncomfortable, and it's it's countries are those Southeast Asian countries are somewhat anxious about whether they will be able to continue or resume uh, developing hydrocarbons if China keeps pressing so hard, and so the fishermen also wonder if their livelihoods are coming to an end. Uh, so I'll stop there, and thanks, Mark, and I'll turn it back to you. Well, a lot has happened. Um in the past uh, couple of months since you published this book, um, in particular reference to COVID-19. And so I, my next question would be, how has the um, response from China due to COVID-19 affected its relationship with um, you know, the countries of Southeast Asia and in the region? Yeah. Um. So China uh, it has a lot of trade that goes across the border that was stopped. The tourists, that was all stopped. So that had a huge immediate impact in countries like Vietnam, which is a huge exporting uh, juggernaut, uh, gets a lot of its inputs even for, for garments, for cloth and buttons and zippers, all that stuff from China. So that, that was a real blow. Um, countries were obviously somewhat frustrated that the COVID came from China, but they sort of sympathized when China after Lunar New Year finally got its act together and put a stop to it, um, or you know, gradually put a stop to it. And um, they, then China started sending all kinds of aid. That was a little bit irritating to countries. They would send, send portable latrines to Myanmar and then have companies come and have their picture taken so it would be in the newspaper. And people wondered what the heck, well, why latrines were you know, the cutting edge of uh, COVID. Um, and then, you know, they did the masks, the mask diplomacy, and now we're in the middle of uh, vaccine diplomacy. That's, that's been the latest thing. So some big countries that are just really whacked out by COVID that have not had any ability to bring it under control are Indonesia with its giant population of over 250 million people on 17,000 islands. Um, and the Philippines with fewer, uh, 100 million people and a few fewer islands, but also a lot of islands. Um, they're they're uh, having real trouble because the US is just saying, um, you know, we're not, in the West are saying, we're gonna save the vaccines for us first. And if there's any left, we'll sell it to you, but at market prices. So they're turning really to China and China and Russia are both offering, um, uh, you know, several hundred thousand doses of this vaccine and that vaccine to those two countries. They'll probably bring more into the, I mean, I think I would imagine Cambodia and Laos will also get vaccines, but it's the two that are, it's Philippines and Indonesia that are pushing the hardest for it. And there's already some um, a test, testing going on, the, uh, testing the vaccine on some groups of, some groups of the population. Um, I think in the end, it just will be, uh, pretty minor blip, uh, you know, I mean, it'll be a blip, but not a, a huge thing. Um, the US actually, ironically, to these countries that are 
are, are crawling to China. The U.S. actually quietly gave in most countries quite a bit more. Uh, quietly through USAID, didn't ask for headlines in the newspaper. Um, but the other thing that there's some anticipation of that companies are going to realize that having uh, the, their whole supply chain going through China is going, it was really difficult, uh, especially in medicines and medical equipment, and that they may end up doing some diversification. So Vietnam is getting some investment, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, but it's not nearly as big as, as, as it often sounds. Uh, they're getting some, but, but you know, it's hard to move from China, as you know, because the companies have trillions of dollars invested and in these supply chains. You go to Vietnam and suddenly, yeah, you can plunk a factory down pretty easily, but it doesn't have the ecosystem of screws and this gizmo and that gizmo and screens. China has all that stuff, right? And so it's really expensive and slow to move. So China is not going to lose everything overnight to Southeast Asia, I don't think. I would be uh, totally remiss if I didn't acknowledge what was happening uh, later this evening at nine o'clock. Um, and so my next question is going to sort of uh, acknowledge that factor and how that might affect the region. So how could, a, um, how could an administration change or another uh, you know, term of President Trump affect US policy um, in the region and um, uh, given uh, China's influence in Southeast Asia? Yeah. It's a good question. Um, still trying to figure it out, obviously. But, you know, Trump was re is really liked by some officials. Uh, Duterte of Philippines, Hong Stan of Cambodia, they're all into fake news and all that stuff themselves now. Um, Vietnam liked them uh, uh, because, like Trump, because he's finally somebody standing up to China, which they feel a little bit lonely in that occupation sometimes. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I don't know how much Biden changes. I think, um, uh, I think he would be uh, less, you'd use less sharp rhetoric, less fewer sharp elbows. Uh, I don't think he's going to totally back down. He will not totally back down on some of the uh, tariffs and sanctions on China and Chinese companies. I think, as you probably know, there is, there's pretty wide um, bipartisan acceptance that China might have gone a bit far in stealing I IP, intellectual property, uh, forcing tech transfer, that kind of stuff. And so uh, uh, th there's probably uh, some support for, for quite a bit of support for Biden continuing that. The, the, he might however, look for other areas to cooperate. He believes in climate change and you dealing with climate change and you can't do that without China. Uh, he might like China to join and, and come back. They, the US might come back and, and wishes to join China in dealing with Iran's nuclear program. Uh, some of that stuff. So I think there'd be changes around the margins, but I don't think we'd see a 180 degree flip uh, on January 21st. My last question um, is regarding uh, one of the other latest developments. Um, we have a new Japanese prime minister. And how do you um, envision that development um, operating and playing into um, you know, Japan's ability to compete with China uh, moving forward in Southeast Asia? So um, one, one thing. Uh, that, that Southeast Asia has been doing. You know, they're, they're anxious about China's rise uh, and where that's all gonna go. And they don't quite trust the US. They just say the US is, uh, uh, is always a little bit late, too little, too late kind of stuff. And not, you know, from one transition from one administration to another, they're halfway through before they, they figure out where Southeast Asia is. So it's a bit of a, so they don't fire entirely feel comfortable with the US. And then, um, uh, but so what do you do? So they have really been working at hedging uh, for, for a number of years and that the Japanese are probably the number one hedger. So Japan is a pretty big aid donor, a very big investor, still the biggest investor, much bigger than the US. 
uh, considerably bigger than the U.S. and much bigger than China, although China's coming up very fast. Uh, and then, uh, so yeah, they they liked they liked the fact that Abe uh, was a little flexed his biceps a little bit more, uh, and and they think the new pri uh, prime minister will likely do the same with China. Um, and then they they view look at other countries, the European Union. They're all signing trade. All the free traders are signing trade agreements with the EU, the Vietnamese, the Sings, Singaporeans, um, and uh, uh, India. They all like India to be more active. They tell you constantly, well, you wish they would start acting east. They say they're going to act east and act east for heaven's sake. But uh, they think India is is and they're just way too protectionist for the tastes of most Southeast Asian governments. Um, uh, but yeah, Japan is is a serious player. They love Chinese, excuse me, they, they sort of love Japanese infrastructure. They love the interest rates at 0.7%, but it takes a Japanese five years from when they start designing the project until the full approval. And they say, like the Chinese, they'll do an Im economic impact assessment and environmental impact assessment and say we'll do it right while we're building we can do all of that stuff at the same time which is a bit loony but uh, um and so uh they they wish the japanese some had a few more of the chinese traits and in building infrastructure great um so we have a first question um so just if you can introduce yourself and your affiliation i'm going to call on edith so you have the first question. I'm a big admirer and also a former Far Eastern Economic Review uh, alumnus. And as you can probably hmm. see, a not so young uh, China watcher. Um, I wanted to uh, basically look north um, to the impact of a potential conflict uh, between China and Taiwan. Uh, Xi Jinping obviously wants uh, uh, reunification or unification with Taiwan to be part of his legacy. And there's a set, there's been, there's sort of a heating up of the Taiwan Strait at the moment. But harking back to the uh, third Taiwan Strait crisis in 1996, the impact on Southeast Asia at that time was a sense that uh, the US really wasn't committed to the region. But people were surprised. The U.S. sent two uh, carrier groups uh, in, and sort of stood off the Taiwan Strait and China backed down. Now, I just heard yesterday one of the senior Washington uh, sort of Asia policy uh, people who shall remain unnamed uh, describe that as the starting point of China's military buildup because they realized they could not win with the military, with the armaments they had at the time. The situation has changed 180 degrees at the moment. The same pundit said, uh, everyone knows they would win. Now, occupation, different thing. Um, so my question is, uh, in the, especially in the light of those very interesting uh, poll numbers, what would be the impact on Southeast Asia? Would that force them uh, Singapore in particular, uh, to take sides? Uh, and would they, uh, and whose side do you think they would choose? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, well, good to meet you. I don't really, you know, I didn't expect to meet a review alumni here because the magazine closed in 2004. <laughs> so you couldn't be terribly young and still have worked there. Uh, like, uh, But yeah, it's, um, I still stay in touch with a lot of our old cronies, um, especially traveling in Southeast Asia. I meet a lot of them. Um, and um, yeah, so on your question though, um, <clears throat> boy, Southeast Asia would, you know, they just really don't know what to do in a case like that. They say, they constantly say, Prime Minister Li Sing Lung says, please don't make us choose. Um, they really, as I mentioned, Singapore is the largest investor in China. It's a huge trading partner. Um, and economically, it keeps, keeps Singapore afloat, basically. Um, and, you know, if they, there, there's a, a battle, they would, um, I don't know what they would do. 
Uh, obviously, they're under a lot of pressure to go with China if it's happening locally, but they don't feel they don't feel they're going to get space to necessarily be themselves uh, with a with a, with a China in charge of the region. So there would be a lot of hand wringing. They would uh, they would try they would they would hedge till the last minute. Uh, they would try to balance the U.S. and hope the U.S. You know, Singapore, when the, US, when the U.S. was forced out of the Philippines, Singapore uh, allowed the U.S. to set up bases effectively. They don't call them that, but they have rotational access to these facilities at Changi and uh, uh, other places. And they, 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 uh, they do that because they want to keep sending signals to China. But I, I couldn't tell you what they would do uh, in the heat of the moment. Uh, they would just struggle to try to stay as neutral as possible. They know a war like that will devastate the region and put it back 50 years or something. Uh, the next question will come from uh, Jomo. Yeah, a uh, pleasure to be a uh, part of this group this evening. Uh, my name is Jomo Smith. I'm a uh, professor of history in upstate Minnesota, um, Asian history. Um, that's mostly China, um, teach Japan and world history as well. Um, thank you for uh, the discussion thus far. And I'm just wondering if we can um, just sort of uh, expand uh, the, the topic slightly. So in terms of, you know, we're looking at these various different Southeast Asian nations and of course China's uh, influence on them. Um, you know, it occurred to me as, as you're speaking that uh, China, you know, particularly in, in reference to population movements into, into Laos and, and Myanmar, um, is doing similar things in the Russian Far East, right? Uh, specifically um, Siberia, right? So the areas north of Yilongjiang and um, uh, Jilin, et cetera, right? There are more Chinese that are moving there to farm, um, et cetera. And so when we look at um, China's near abroad uh, in, in general, right? We do see a growing uh, Chinese influence. Uh, we might call this a growing uh, amount of, of, of Chinese hegemony. And so I'm curious, when you, when you travel, have traveled through Southeast Asia, um, the politicians you've spoken to, business people that you've spoken to, how they, they really are, are responding to this? Because uh, it is no longer a question of China's rise. Uh, China has clearly risen. Uh, mm -hmm. China's influence, uh, monetary influence, uh, the ability, for example, to uh, you know, finance uh, Putin's regime by uh, continuing to buy uh, Russian natural gas and to you know, um, uh, buttress the Hang Seng regime in, in Cambodia. Um, you know, China is here. And as much as uh, the U.S. still continues to play a role in Asia and in Southeast Asia specifically, there obviously is, is a concern among some that the U.S. is in the decline or that at least uh, at some point in the near future, <laughs> the U.S. is no longer going to, to play um, a role in that region. Now, obviously, that's a hypothetical. Um, there, you know, I, I personally don't believe that's going to happen uh, anytime soon. Um, but at least there, there is that concern out there. So uh, you've mentioned uh, a number of times in the degree to which uh, different nations seem to be hedging. Uh, but, but how do you, I guess my question is, how do you see uh, this actually playing out? Um, and, 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 and is there a way for us to, to find uh, a happy medium, if you will, right? I mean, clearly there are some within China, uh, within uh, you know, the, the party apparatus, uh, who have made it very clear that they want the United States out of Asia. I mean, that's a very uh, dangerous proposition, um, a, a proposition that I think they have not thought about clearly. Uh, the US out of Asia means a resurgent Japan. I don't think China is ready to deal with a resurgent Japan. I don't think China comprehends what a resurgent Japan would mean. Um, and, but, but nevertheless, uh, China, I think, as I said, various individuals have articulated this desire uh, to see the United States out of the out of the game. Clearly, that's not going to happen anytime soon, at least in my view. Uh, but how do we how do we reach uh, some sort of happy medium? Uh, Chinese investment is needed in these various different countries. Uh, you know, Western nations aren't ponying up to invest in Myanmar or ponying up to invest in Laos, Cambodia, etc. And so these nations need Chinese investment. Uh, but it comes along with certain hazards. Um, and so how they, they deal with those hazards um, is, you know, is really uh, the challenge uh, that, you know, I think they face. So I'm just curious about some of your commentary on that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, you talk to the elites in all these countries, even in Cambodia, 
A lot of them really are worried about where this is going. Uh, they're wondering what happens with the generational change in Cambodia. Does Hung Sen's son, Hung Mane, does he also have the same views despite the fact that he graduated from West Point? Uh, um, and there's a, a really a, a wish that, you know, in a lot of countries, the U.S. is pretty active in investing. One of those is Vietnam. Um, but the, the part of what the administration, this administration, set up the uh, Development Finance Corp. Uh, uh, last year, in fact, uh, yeah, sort of last year, uh, it's the old OPEC, and uh, they got $60 billion from Congress, which, you know, next to the Chinese trillions are uh, pretty small peanuts. But uh, they're hoping that by, by uh, cooperating in projects with the Japanese, with the Aussies, with the private sector, they'll be able to have a slightly bigger role in the region. But yeah, it's terribly small, uh, for sure. Uh, but then if you work with the Japanese, you can eventually have maybe a little bit of impact. But but uh, now they, like I said, they before. I mean, they're really hoping that they they want to benefit from China. They just hope and pray that it doesn't lead to giving up uh, giving up sovereignty. Uh, and that's in some places a bit of a concern. Like Cambodia has has the uh, has has the uh, uh, the naval port at at at, at Riem, where. Um, the, the U.S. helped build and the Aussies helped build some facilities. And early this week, uh, the, um, the, 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 there was all kinds of reporting in 2019, so a little over a year ago, that uh, Intel, U.S. Intel reporting that the Chinese had signed a secret, secret deal to set up a naval port there. Well, you know, and, and Hung San denies it on, on all the holy books known to man or woman. And, uh, and, but then um, uh, this week, the satellite photos start picking up that the, the facilities that the U.S. had built, the U.S. built the early ones with, with the Aussies, those were bulldozed over this week. So what are they going to build in, the, in its place, right? Um, I, I, um, it's going to be, uh, you know, I, I think the U.S., if the U.S. got more active, uh, it could probably push back, help these countries push back a little. Some countries are really not accepting investment very much. I referred earlier to the Czech Pew stuff in Myanmar. Um, they're, they're holding the Chinese off. They don't want the debt. Uh, and in, in Laos, you might have seen a couple of weeks ago, uh, the beginning of September, uh, the Lao had to turn over part of their... their uh, their, uh, uh, their electricity distribution company to a, a Chinese uh, power company, which is really the beginning of the, the, the debt trap issue that we faced, we saw happening in Sri Lanka. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think these countries have much hope other than just hedging with, with the US, with the Japanese, with the Aussies, the EU, and try to survive in the middle of this while taking advantage of what good China can bring them. I know it's a terribly lousy, the other thing I would actually say, um, one thing I saw while, while doing my reporting was that the Southeast Asians all have their own bilateral relationship with Beijing. They all want to think, you know, if we, we, we cozy up to them, they're gonna give us good deals, they're gonna treat us right, that kind of stuff. Well, um, uh, by not talking to each other, M Malaysia, for example, is paying almost two to uh, is paying almost is paying over four percent interest for its high speed rail, while Laos is paying two point three, and the ties have been offered too. Um, they they find ways that they can get around some of the demands of the Chinese if they would stand together. The same would be true as if if Malaysia, Vietnam, and the Philippines could talk to each other when the Chinese are harassing the Dickens out of their oil and gas projects, or uh, if, if Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, and Thailand could cooperate in standing up to China in the Mekong. It could have a, a pretty, China would hate it if these countries all stood up, got up at the UN and started yelling at the China every year. 
or there's this this international there's this um, convention passed by the UN that that deals with non-navigable rivers, rivers that are used for non-navigable purposes, that would include the Mekong. But there's 17 of these rivers that allegedly begin in China. If, 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 if the Mekong countries would start cooperating with, with China's other neighbors, they could really bring a lot of humiliate, uh, you know, embarrassment to bear on China, I think. We, we've got to find ways uh, to stand up to China, not let them divide and divide and rule a region like Southeast Asia. Well, um, let's. Uh, I know we're close to time, so we'll do um, one round of questions. Um, so I'm going to call on three people. If you can just, we can just um, ask the questions at once, and then uh, give Murray some time to respond. Um, so Eliza, um, Will, and then Spike. Um, is ask your questions, and then we can um, transition to this being the last round of answers. Well, hi, I'm Eliza. Uh, I just graduated from SICE in May, and thank you so much for your presentation. That was really helpful. Uh, I was curious, you guys kind of just touched on it, but what China's impact is on ASEAN and the region's ability to coordinate as a whole. And uh, Murray, I, I know I can ask this question at uh, any time, but I, I also wanted to respond specifically to the point that you made about earlier generations of, of ethnic Chinese in Southeast Asia presenting less of a challenge uh, to civil unrest. So uh, in the context of Indonesia, Cambodia, Malaysia, all of these places had outright armed ethnic conflicts that frequently targeted Chinese uh, ethnic groups. And I can't imagine that doesn't reverberate today in the domestic politics of all of these countries and also their relations with China PRC today. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Murray, thanks for taking the time to share some of your insight. Uh, my name is Spike Nowak. I'm, uh, I work for a PATH, a global health NGO, and I'm based out of Hanoi. Um, COVID-19 made a lot of countries and companies realize that their supply chains are too concentrated in China and now they're looking to diversify to other countries. Um, within this context, are there specific economic uh, policies or industries China wants to see developed in Vietnam? Uh, and if so, are there specific political channels or tactics they're using to achieve these goals? Thank you. Can I just ask about that? Whether, whether the Chinese are encouraging this? They know it's happening. Um, yes. So I'm wondering if there is any influence they're trying to exert to shape this at all. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, I think I sort of answered the ASEAN one. They do, they, China much prefers uh, to deal with individual countries, but when it has to deal with ASEAN, it usually has a proxy. It knows that ASEAN can't do anything without uh, uh, unanimity. And so uh, you, the, the famous case in 2012 when Cambodia was hosting the ASEAN regional forum and the uh, which includes ASEAN foreign ministers and about uh, 18 or 20 from other countries. And that when the South China Sea stuff was discussed among the ASEANs, they, they couldn't come to a consensus because the Cambodian foreign minister uh, was blocking it. And we learned later that uh, there was a ch Chinese it, all over the foreign ministry that were advising them how to operate, uh, what they should do. And so the ASEAN for the first time wasn't able to come up with a concluding statement. Um, and it took several weeks uh, by, uh, by the Indonesian foreign minister to uh, finally come to an agreement. This happens quite regularly um, where uh, uh, usually it's, it's Cambodia. Laos, when they hosted in 2017, agreed to what, what, what the consensus was in, uh, in, in the South China Sea. But, but China really does work one-on-one -on -one and tries to, doesn't do, do um, uh, projects across the region easily. It is negotiating, when it's doing the railroad uh, from Kunming to Singapore, it is negotiating with each country separately. It would be far better to do it together. Uh, then countries would know what the other is doing and know if it made sense to build the Lao Railroad. Um, yeah, um, yes, that, that is still a, the, the, to Will's question about the uh, ethnic Chinese, 
Uh, yes, there is, of course, the concern about the guys that were fighting fighting uh, against the central governments in the in the 50s and 60s, in some cases like Philippines, even into the 70s. Um, but generally, those people just managed to sort of disappear, um, except in Myanmar, where they are are a lot of them are now collect are situated in Shan State and doing all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's quite um, notorious. They're drug, drug smuggling, gun smuggling, the whole business. Um, but the, it's, it, it is in the back of everybody's mind. And so they will, that, that is a, a, a factor for distrust uh, in all the countries dealing. So it comes up a, a fair amount. Uh, you know, they treated us like that. And the older people especially remember that. The younger people, um, the millennials and stuff, do, do not really see that as an issue anymore. And I think there's just generally more for the, the, the old timers, even if they were, even if they were fighting in central government, they came in from the cold kind of thing. And they, they, many of them are more Malay, Malaysian than they are Chinese. They're more, even though they speak some Hokkien or something, but, uh, but they um, are much more integrated with the locals than, than the newcomers who are really very often arrogant and standoffish and see themselves as short timers. The old timers, you know, have been there forever and they want to stay. The new guys come in for a couple of years of investment and, and invest and make money and gamble and, and leave. Uh, so it's a rather different culture. But, but the old stuff from the 50s is still uh, as, uh, affecting the, the underlying sentiments toward China. Um, I don't know exactly what, what China is thinking about the movement of supply chain. There is, there is some, uh, obviously, some movement to Vietnam. Um, uh, the, the, but when, when there was, uh, Vietnam was joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, it was re really interesting that Chinese companies uh, especially when the U.S. was still in, it's Chinese companies realized that they would be able to get much better deals uh, exporting out of Vietnam. So uh, quite a few garment factories, textile factories, others moved to Vietnam to take, take advantage of the, the TPP and I guess now the CPTPP. Um, the more recent stuff, I haven't heard what the, what the Chinese think. Uh, they are very open to companies going abroad, or at least they were before COVID. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I guess we'll have to see how that plays out. Uh, but like I said earlier, there, there's some movement to, to Vietnam, and Vietnam is maybe the biggest, but it is still quite limited because of the, the ecosystem just isn't right. Vietnam also doesn't have enough skilled labor. Uh, land is expensive uh, with, with not getting terribly much and infrastructure is poorly developed compared to China. So it's still, it's still not perfect. It would take a couple of decades, I would think, until Vietnam could really begin to play a bigger role. And then they just don't, there are 100 million people that's the size of one Chinese province rather than the size of, you know, of the country, which is one point three times, 13 times bigger than Vietnam. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Amari, for being able to speak with us about this amazing um, new book. I want to encourage everyone um, to go and get yourself a fresh copy. It's at you know, every major uh, you know, bookseller and you can buy it online, it's on Kindle as well. Um, but also thank you to the attendees um, for joining us. I know that, um, you know, you can do, be doing a lot of different things uh, in your evening and you decided to spend an hour with us to learn um, on this very fascinating topic of Chinese influences in, in Southeast Asia. So um, we definitely will love you for you all to join us on our next Young China Watchers uh, DC event. Um, encourage you to stay uh, connected to us through the listserv and reach out to us if you have any questions. But thank you so much, Mary, for taking this time. And um, we really enjoyed this conversation and learned a lot. Um, and we can't wait for uh, the next version because we know that there's a lot more that could have been said in this book. Thanks, Mark.
Thanks, everybody. It was a pleasure to be here. I, it's fascinating. Different audiences have different insights. So it's always a lot of fun to do this. So thanks a lot, guys. And uh, go enjoy a more entertaining speaker than me. <laughs> Sorry. Good luck to everybody. Thank you, Murray. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.